It's what I used to tell my poor mother, which I had to say to her, don't you see that you never believe anything until after it happens? You are the number one antagonistic to my faith in all those years. You've seen these things and you never believe until after. You do not have a supernatural faith that can save you. I don't have any reason to believe my mother's born again. She doesn't have a faith that even believes God. How will God be able to justify somebody that stands before him at the throne that says, well, I believed you to get me here on the other side of death, but God says, yeah, but you didn't believe me for anything up to your death. Why should I let you in? How come people can't reason that out? How come people can't see that God cannot be mocked? A man reaps what he sows. You cannot deny him, show him contempt, and cast doubt on his every move and say that he's some impotent old man in a spiritual wheelchair. And then finally, close your eyes in this life and magically wake up and God is just so pleased with you because 35 years back, you said a stinking prayer from a fat minister who never knew God from day one. And somehow another God is supposed to be so pleased with you that he says, welcome in my good and faithful servant who did nothing for him because you didn't have faith, because you couldn't be moved by him. But oh, you watched the documentary, you saw the Bethlehem star, you saw a case for Christ, you saw that an atheist was able to go out and reason Christ into his mind. Well, there must be a reason why false faith, false faith, false faith everywhere. It's a counterfeit. If God can't move you now, he can't save you then. One of the most frightening passages in the entire Old Covenant to me that I consistently have come back up in my teachings is Psalm 78, 18 through 22. It reads, they, Israel, willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was furious or very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob and his wrath rose against Israel. Why? Verse 22 for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Brothers and sisters, there is no greater sin, there is no deadlier sin in the entire Bible than that which came to those who claimed to believe in God but had no true faith and trust in him. I'd like to share with you John Gill's commentary on Psalm 78, 22. Because they believed not in God, that he was able to give them bread and provide flesh for them or bring them through the wilderness to Canaan's land as he had promised. God and he only is the object of faith and he is to be believed in at all times and for all things, temporal and spiritual. And nothing is more displeasing to God than un belief. For as faith gives glory to him, unbelief reflects dishonor upon him. Faith sets its seal to him as true, but unbelief makes him a liar. And what is more provoking to man than to have his veracity called into question and to be counted a liar? In short, as faith has salvation annexed to it, unbelief has damnation. And to whom did the Lord swear that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So great an evil is unbelief. And it is the sin which so easily beset the Israelites as appears from the context. See also Hebrews 3. 12. Brothers and sisters, God is indignant and furious against repeated unbelief. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear.
Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained. Though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. That's pretty interesting. There's still some vulnerability there. So Sanballat and Goshem sent a message to me asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sanballat's servant came with an open letter in his hand and this is what it said. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations and Geshem tells me it is true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel and that that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. These are all lies, by the way. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you, look, there is a king in Judah. So these are all lies being made up to try to stop the work. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work or stop faith or stop moving forward. So I continued the work with even greater determination. There it is. God appoints opposition as an incentive to faith. And I don't believe that it was too far back that I remember reading Austin Sparks was saying that Israel only encountered opposition when they were moving forward. You don't encounter opposition sitting in the wilderness. It's only when you start moving forward, there are oppositions, kings, forces, antagonistics, family members standing in your way. Satan will use them to try to stop you. It's only when you're moving forward. I've woken this morning to a message from Lisa where she was up sick in the middle of the night with her stomach worried, having fears of Satan. Sounds a bit like what happened with Carol Ann waking up cold sweats in the middle of the night. Satan attacks. You foolish woman, you foolish woman. You're gonna send all this money with no receipt to this man. What a foolish woman. I wish that this didn't have to happen. I wish that it was easier, but faith is not easy. It never has been, it never will be, lest it be completely unpleasing to God. How many times have we seen we try to move forward and we get hit with massive amounts of opposition? It doesn't matter whether it was moving the house. It doesn't matter whether it was getting the house out of the U.S. It doesn't matter whether it was getting the house into New Zealand. It then doesn't matter if it was us getting it out of the port. There was opposition facing every single step of the process. Then we try to send the bags and you'd think that we were trying to send millions of dollars in stolen property into New Zealand. It was unbelievable the opposition that we face. So every time you move forward, you're gonna have opposition. God has appointed it. And then that's when you have to decide, are you gonna be like Peter and look at the wind and the waves? Or are you gonna be unlike Nehemiah and go down and talk with the people who wanna debate with you about your poor faith and your delusions of madness? and who maybe are not intentionally lying to you like Sanballat, but who have been lied to, led astray, taken captive of Satan, and who do not have a true gift of faith, don't have a saving faith inside of them. They have a professed faith in Christ. They have a belief system that has no power. They have not truly made God Lord. They are not his sheep. They do not hear his voice. No matter how he chooses to speak, they're not hearing it. And so then they look at those who do hear as, you're delusional, this is mad, this is numerology, this is schizophrenia, this is whatever you wanna throw it at. So Ravi in India who hears God speak audibly every morning at four o'clock will know that God doesn't do that. I mean, we can find websites that show God doesn't speak audibly uh, anymore. That's just, that's clearly, totally delusional deception of, 
um, you know, his mind, uh, clearly the guy is, uh, well, he's uh, schizophrenic, right? I mean, that's carnal flesh, unbelieving, unregenerated, professing false Christians have to come up with some website explanation or some psychological definition to fit their need for meaning in something they do not understand and they do not possess. And this is what happens. And this is where the opposition comes. And then it makes you feel bad because you have that same part of you in you that is in them. You have the carnal flesh. You have the atheist. You have the person who is given to unbelief. You have the part of you that wants to stay right where you're at and stay comfortable. You have the part of you that can say, yeah, this doesn't make a lot of sense and can lean on human sense, can lean on human understanding and ignore Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Well, that's exactly what we've done. We've trusted him with all of our heart. And if we have thrown ourselves at the mercy of God and God allows us to be deceived, when I've given him as much sincerity and as much faith and as much hope and as much obedience and as much fear of God as I can possibly muster up with his help, by his grace, led by his spirit, and he leads me to hell, then so be it. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But when a man knows he's heard from God or a woman, and you shrink back, that is the greatest disaster in the, in the history of the world. I watched it happen in my own marriage. And the scriptures tell us, 1 Corinthians 10, that all of what happened to the Israelites of their shrinking back and their showing contempt for God and not believing he had the power to do what he said he would do was contempt and he put them all to death because of their unbelief. They allowed what they saw with their eyes, heard with their ears, and the rumors that spread to put fear in their hearts and stop them from believing. And this is one of the most horrific sins we commit against God. And this is why it's so hard to have faith today, true faith, because you're gonna find so few people around you that have it. It's very easy to believe, as I said in the recording the other day, when you get on a plane, whether you're a true Christian, a carnal Christian, a counterfeit, a Buddhist, an atheist, Muslim, secularist, you get on an airplane, you're practicing faith. You have reason to believe that when you get on that plane, you're gonna take off and land safely. But you're doing so based on evidence of millions of people that have had the experience of safely taking off and safely reaching their destination. And so human reasoning says, you know, one out of a million takeoffs and landings ends in a fatality. And I'm not likely to be the one in a million. So even though I'm uncomfortable with this, I'm gonna do it. That's faith, but that's faith of the human will. That's faith that even a godless uh, atheist can come up with. That is not the faith that is the gift of God that enables people to believe and be moved by God into the impossible and into the contradictory. Anybody can believe Jesus died historically shed his blood on a cross, was buried in a tomb, was raised three days later, and ascended into heaven. It's a wonderful story. And billions of people believe it. Just like billions of people have takeoff and successful landings, billions of people believe in this religious system, Christianity, and it's not a faith that can save them. It's not the gift of faith. It's not the supernatural faith. It's no different than the faith that, again, the atheist has who gets on an airplane and says, I'm going to make it. That's not a supernatural faith. That's a natural faith. Entrepreneurs have faith. I'm going to take this much money, spend this much time, and this business is going to succeed. When they move forward, they have faith. They say, you know, there's a risk here. Other people have done this before, uh, and I know that I may fail, but man, I'm going to take a shot and that motivational speaker and that pep talk and you know what I mean? I, I got to take a chance and I can't be afraid and I got to have courage. That's faith, but that's not supernatural faith. That has nothing to do with walking with God. The faith of walking with God is a supernatural faith that enables you to see the invisible and to believe 
the impossible and to do the contradictable. Supernatural faith completely contradicts human reasoning. And again, one of the most frightening and yet helpful things for me as a minister is to recognize that I know what supernatural faith is and I have a person in me who is all natural, who has a natural faith, who has natural unbelief and who is a natural antagonism to the supernatural moves of God. It's a constant anchor trying to hold on to the earth, trying to send roots down, trying to be unmoved, trying to have its way. Movement is uncomfortable. Risk is uncomfortable. I wanna just stay right here and I have that thing in me. It has to be put down by a supernatural gift of faith. And faith is the vehicle, not the destination. It enables me to get to God, to please God, to hear God, to obey God, to contradict everything in me that is against God. And every Christian I've ever met that calls himself a Christian. And that's why I've come up against so many hardships and relationships. And I've had to walk away from so many people because they can't go far with me. They don't have the supernatural gift of faith. I heard the sermon. I was convinced of the evidence. I said a prayer. I believe in Jesus. And now I'm going to follow him. And you've got nothing in your bag packed except for natural faith that came from the same faith you had to get on an airplane to go to that conference to believe Jesus to begin with. And now you come up against real Christianity and you come up against things that are really difficult. And now you find out, do you really have faith? Do you really have oil in your lamp? Do you really have grace of Jesus Christ? It's just last night, my son, he says to me, dad, I think I'm going to quit. I'm having thoughts of quitting tonight. I said, oh, son, what happened? He came home early. Oh, this manager really yelled at me. And I said, oh, really, what happened? Oh, well, the... and it had something to do with him beginning to put the chairs up early and close up because something happened in the kitchen where they could no longer cook. They ran out of gas or something. So he just takes it upon himself. Well, we're going to have to close the restaurant. So he starts putting up some available tables and chairs. And apparently a person got really mad at him and yelled at him and Tyler kind of laughed a little bit in a mocking way back to the person. And I had to explain to him that this is where it calls for great humility. And I said, now you get to see how difficult it is to be a true Christian when things like this come up, they are very, very difficult. And now we find out, do we have a supernatural grace? Are we able to go to Christ in that moment and say, God, help me to bring my flesh down. Lord, help me in my unbelief. God, help me to be humble. Grant me the grace to do what I cannot do. The nature cannot bow before other people like that unless it's got an incredibly strong incentive, like a fear of life or a fear of a loss of job. Anybody can do that if the fear of non-submission is greater than the fear of submission. The fear of swallowing your pride is less than the fear of whatever consequence may come from you not doing so. Anybody can do that. But when the consequences aren't that high in the natural, but supernaturally you call yourself a Christian and you are to obey the teachings of Christ, this requires faith. And I was explaining to him how even something like this requires faith. Everything is by faith. Your ability to know that that's wrong is by faith. Your ability to read and believe Jesus' teachings about what you're supposed to respond. Matthew 5, 39, do not resist an evil person. This is by faith. Your ability to do that and receive the grace to do what you cannot and do not naturally want to do is by faith. You're waiting on God to give you the grace to do what you cannot naturally do is by faith. And if you do not have a true faith, you will not wait and you will begin to be like all these other multiplied millions of false counterfeit Christians who sat inside a church building that didn't have God in it probably ever and were told if you've said a prayer and you've got on your knees or you came to the altar call or you joined a Bible study or you started reading the Bible and you started using the name of Jesus Christ, you're saved and you're good. But you missed exactly what we've been 
reading about that A.W. Pink so eloquently points out and pleads with people to see in his book, Exposition of Hebrews in the Faith of Moses, where you have to understand that before the Passover, before you're covered under the blood, and before you get to bypass the death angel who's coming after all of us, you need to have first have done and followed the steps of Moses' faith to have forsaken his birthrights in this world, to have forsaken his natural family, to have forsaken his natural country, to have forsaken his natural comforts. He forsook the world. You cannot come to Christ with the world still in you. You have to come to Christ willing to forsake the world. You have to come to Christ, not that you are the master and he's the giver of salvation, but he is savior and Lord, he is your master. This requires faith. And when people haven't come to Jesus Christ through the true gospel, they have not received a true conversion and there is no true faith. They are all flesh trying to apprehend a Christian set of beliefs and you cannot do it. And this is why people fail. And this is why so many ministers have to give these people these false, you're gonna be okay. Nobody's perfect. I mean, oh, thank God for the finished work of Jesus Christ. And thank God he remembers that we're all human. Yes, but you don't lean on that as the foundation of your basis for God and having a relationship with him. That's true when we stumble after we have fought like crazy in faith. And when we stumble, that's true in a moment. But that's not true of an ongoing lifestyle. And that is no true foundation in Christ that has not forsaken the world and that has not made him Lord. And that is not hearing him and doing his personal will as Lord, a living Lord. Not a general Lord of a bunch of people called Christians a personal Lord of each one who will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. Each one who will be judged by their words. By your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you'll be condemned. It has nothing to do with what y'all said. It has nothing to do with what y'all did. That's old covenant Israel. And so you have people trying so hard to do Christianity and they are doing a false Christianity. If I, could, I would give anything if I could get people to see this. You can just go on YouTube and you can go on with your little group at your godless, spiritless church building and you can keep on practicing the tenets of Christianity, but you have no faith. There is no sense in you that you've been separated from the world, that you've lost your life to find it, that you hate your life in this world, that you're denying yourself, taking up your cross, that you're hearing Jesus Christ speak to you. There is nothing living behind your profession of faith. And here's how you find out. When you get around somebody who is a true Christian and that person has a true supernatural faith and God begins to move in their life and you see it. And for a time you emulate that and then you come up against a brick wall. You come up against fortified cities with walls up to the sky. You come across a Jordan River at flood stage. You come across a Red Sea with the Egyptians hot on your tail. You come across the fact that you just stepped out of the boat to walk on water and you realize you do not have what it takes to do this. And you make an effort and you fail. Perhaps you make multiple efforts and you fail. Perhaps you try to follow God's guidance, God's providence, but you didn't ever have a true saving faith. And so your results, a tree recognized by its fruit end in failure. Your heart, you begin to wrestle. You begin to make reason for why is this happening? And where do you end up but on Google for all the answers? Consulting flesh and blood, surely somebody has the answer for why I'm not able to follow in this person's footsteps or why when I tried this, I got a totally different result or why I can't put down my evil tongue or why I can't give up the world or why I can't stop sinning and watching porno or why I can't stop screaming at the people in traffic with me or why I can't stop losing my temper every single day at my child or, or whatever it is. Whatever it is that you realize from the example that you're seeing in the person with true faith, whether it's liberation from sin or whether it's 
moving into something impossible, moving into something difficult, moving into something that makes no sense to anybody around you. When you can't do it, you have to provide yourself with a meaning. Why can't you do it? And the meaning is, I'm not supposed to do it. I have gone on Google and found out that this is false. This is delusional. God no longer speaks. Uh, Jesus did it all. You gotta stop trying so hard. You gotta rest in the quote, finished work of Jesus Christ, which is a completely, as A.W. Pink says, completely distorted, completely defiled teaching in the false evangelical so-called church today. And it applies in no way to any of the people that are sitting in it professing faith in Christ. So you go back to Google and you continue to find speaking with friends, flesh and blood. What do you think about this? I saw in this person's faith where they gave up this or they walked into the courtroom or they gave up Christmas or they um, let this spouse go or they walked away when they believed God told them to from these certain family members or they uh, set aside their, their secular job and began to trust God to provide or they moved forward in building a house without ever even having the money to start the trailer. They took a whole year off of the ministry because they believed God was telling them to do so. They walked away from this person after God warned them multiple times to heed this command, heed this rebuke, and they didn't. And the person turned away from them and they've done this multiple times. And I can't live like that. And I, I've tried and things fail and it gets really difficult for me and I'm afraid of living like that. The reason you're afraid is because you don't have a true supernatural saving faith. It is a gift from God that you have yet to receive. You've been trying to do Christianity in your own natural faith, following like a pack of herd animals, the rest of the pack. And it's so easy to follow a bunch of people that are headed off a cliff they can't see and think that because so many other people are going that way and they say the same Jesus name that you do and they read the same Bible you do and they go to the same spiritless church as you do, well, they must all be right. And I mix my faith with theirs and we're headed off the cliff, but we can't see it. We we have pockets full of counterfeit spiritual $100 bills, but we can't tell and we are sure happy to have filled our pockets and our coffers full We're on our way. We have no idea where we're gonna uh, go when we get there. We believe for sure we're headed to heaven, but we have no evidence in our life. We're a form of religion that denies his power. Our eyes are not open to the need of faith. We haven't forsaken and come out of the world. There's nothing in our life that looks like we lost it to find it. We can't point to any real sacrifices that we've made to be an example and a follower of Jesus Christ, where we ended up having to let the dead bury the dead in our family, or we had to, No one who comes to me and doesn't hate mother and father, brother and sister, wife and children, even his own life can be my disciple. If anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross and deny himself. Unless a man give up everything he has, he cannot be my disciple. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? You adulterous people. We don't have any of those evidences of the hard teachings of the master And as A.W. Pink talks about, we have never taken on the very teaching that Jesus Christ, our Lord, says we must. We have never put his yoke upon our neck. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, come upon me, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. I saw in the message today a deadly satanic deception from what would have been my sister-in-law, but will never be my sister-in-law unless she repents. Jesus said, my mother and brother and sister are those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. And I'm looking at her trying to tell her sister-in-law, my wife, that once you come out of this delusion that God could use numbers and this delusion of numerology, there is such liberty For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This is the quote that she gave. And I'm looking at this going, yep, there sure is. 
as soon as you throw off a yoke of Jesus Christ and you are no longer in bondage to do his will because you never had the supernatural faith to do it to begin with, you better believe there's freedom. You are free from having the constraints of your master around your neck, from sharing the yoke that carried a cross, that denied himself, and that was obedient unto death. You better believe you can get freedom when you get out of this delusional thinking that God is still alive, that God still speaks however he wants, and that there are a group of people on this earth who still have a supernatural faith to believe, to see, to interpret, and to obey the supernatural guidance of God. And you better believe it is a bondage, and you better believe it is a yoke. It is indeed a yoke. It is a yoke that I will, with God's help, for my wife and I both, in the name of Christ, may we never lose this yoke and then turn around and tell other people what freedom, if, if false believing Christians could only see that they have no real supernatural evidence that Jesus Christ is in their life beyond what the pagans I lived with in India have, the Matthew 5, 45 common grace that he gives even to the evil and the wicked. They have no evidence of hearing him, of obeying him, of denying yourself, of having him give them a command that completely contradicts their nature that doesn't make sense to any one of their friends and family around them, except for maybe they stopped cussing so much. Uh, maybe they finally turned off the pornography. Uh, maybe they make a big deal out of their family watching rated R movies. Maybe they put the kids in a Christian school. Maybe they homeschool. Maybe they read the Bible and buy all the devotionals and they have some Christian programming running on their computer all the time, but they don't have any faith. The world is so multiplied full to overflowing with false Christians. People who were sold a bill of goods. People who were told you can have your cake and eat it too. And it doesn't exist except for anywhere behind the pulpit of a false teaching, false spirit, false gospel, spiritless, so-called church. That's the only place you can find that other gospel. I wish it weren't so. I wish I didn't have to wake up to the rude reality that 19 years of my Christianity counted for nothing, that I had no supernatural faith. I've told that story so many times, there's no need to, to tell it again, but I just wanna go back to what we're facing here where as we're moving forward, each step, we get opposition every time. And I believe it by faith that it is appointed of God, that it comes through Satan, and that it's disguised, Satan masquerading as an angel of light, it's disguised oftentimes under the guise of a family member who professes faith, who wants to protect you. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, Every person must decide for themselves whether or not they are deceived or whether or not they are actually walking in a faith that so few people have that the Bible says, will there even be anybody left on this earth who has faith when Jesus Christ comes back? You have to be the one to decide. Are you in possession? Can you judge your own tree and your own heart by its fruit? Do you listen to the good opinion of other people of how you have no idea how they live their lives behind closed doors and you have no visible evidence that they have any kind of a supernatural walk with God, that they have a supernatural faith that has truly set them apart from this world? Are you gonna listen to those people who may very sincerely love you, but who themselves are captives of Satan having no idea that they are? We don't look at them and say that they're a devil but that they are captive, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, captive of Satan to do his will. I mean, at what point do we believe, those of us who are true believers, that when the Bible says that he has taken the whole world captive, that we believe it, that he leads the whole world astray, we believe it, that he holds everyone prisoner by death, fear of death, we believe it, that he goes off to make war against those who hold to the teachings of Christ and obey the commands of God, that he is a roaring lion who walks around, prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. 
that he is the prince of all the principalities of the air and the heavenly realms, that he is the spirit who is now at work in all of those who are disobedient. When do we believe that that is actually the case and stop looking with what we see with our eyes? Oh, she's so pretty. Oh, she does her makeup so nice. Oh, her hair is so cute. Oh, she has such a beautiful smile. Oh, and look at the way she takes care of her children. Oh, and look at him. He's such a hardworking guy and he's just, you know, so diligent and so forth and so on. When do we stop judging Christians by what they look like and sound like on the outside and realize the world is full of counterfeit Christians? People who haven't been born again. No wonder so few people can follow this story. The scriptures are absolutely replete that in the end times, it will be terrible. People will have a love and a faith in everything except for God. They will be mere creatures of instinct, having not the spirit of God. Will wonder at you that you do not, and heap abuse on you that you do not jump into the same flood of dissipation that they do. Only hold on to what you have until I come that no one may take your crown. The fight of faith in the end is going to be exceedingly difficult. It's looking more and more like the type of a fight of faith that you would have had to have had in the beginning of the church. Just as childhood is just as difficult to do as is geriatric stage when you're elderly. We are now clearly in that stage. I've been speaking about it for a number of years ago, 2019, I think is the first time I, I mentioned in a recording that the Lord had shown me that the church is dying. She's in a geriatric stage. She's, she's, she's weakening and she's becoming less and less the true church. And there is a whole view of Christianity that thinks that we're somehow or another still hanging in there, that we're still the majority. No, we're not. You are going to find if you're a true Christian in this world, the greatest persecution you will suffer is at the hands of the false Christians, just exactly the way it was in uh, 300 AD. You have the conversion to an antichrist counterfeit Christianity through Constantin Constantine, and you have the birth of Roman Catholicism. And by the time you get to 600 AD, you have this popery that now has more power than the kings, and you have the Catholic Inquisitions. And what do you have? Who is killing the Christians? Is it the Muslims? Is it the Hindus? Is it the secularists? Is it the pagans? Is it the heathen? Is it the, the plain old vanilla country boy unbeliever? No, it is the professing Christians who think they are the real Christians that are slaughtering the rest of the true Christians. It is gonna be that way in the end. I have no doubt about it, that you're going to be more fiercely persecuted, misunderstood, mocked, ridiculed, tried to explain away, tried to be warned, try to be this, try to be that by the people around you and your family and friends who profess to have a faith that is not real, that is not supernatural. It is completely unnatural. It is completely, oh, it's spiritual, but it's spiritual from down below, not spiritual from on high. It's a counterfeit supernatural faith. I mean, that's the truth. As natural as it is, there's no doubt about it that it's being sustained in many parts and many different so-called churches by a supernatural power, but it's a supernatural power of darkness from the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We have to persevere and we have to continue to see these things and we then have to decide, okay, how much of this do we try to fight against? I think the answer is gonna be very little. Going back to this Nehemiah passage, I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. Keep in mind, a lot of these were fellow believers who are striking at this group of people who are trying to rebuild. There are false believers all around us who will be some of our greatest detriment. There is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination, praise God. And that's what we're gonna do. Later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah and grandson of Mehetabel, who was confined in his home. And he said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. Here's a fear tactic. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I will not do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered the prophecy against me 
because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Here's a guy who's prophesying to him. They're going to come and kill you tonight. It's like the person who came and showed up at my door years ago and said, God showed me you're going to jail over the child support. This was all the way back 11 years ago. I mean, that's just incredible. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. There it is. To shrink back from doing what God asked you to do. To shrink back in fear is sin. And sin, when fully grown, leads to death. The wages of sin is death. Even if it just means temporarily you miss the blessing of God, then you repent. Granted, you don't have any idea when the last time you may be able to sin and repent is, but this is important. You don't knowingly, intentionally sin. You avoid it like the plague. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Remember, oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Salem Ballot have done. And remember so-and-so the prophet and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. Here is a so-called female prophet trying to intimidate. And this is what people will do to us. This is what my sister-in-law, she doesn't realize it. My would-be sister-in-law is trying to do to my wife to intimidate her. I don't want you to be deceived. This can be really bad. I'm just telling you, I know you're going to have a hard time hearing this. Um, yeah, you know why? Because she has faith. Not because we can't identify at all with taking risks and being afraid and, and living a life that completely contradicts our nature and that looks like it makes no sense. Not like we're so oblivious and delusional. We don't know what you're talking about. But we understand that what you're talking about is totally rooted in unbelief and there's no faith in it. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so we choose through the gift and the grace made available to us that we would hope that you would see brings true liberty. The only true liberty where the spirit of the Lord is, the only true freedom is to be totally yoked to him so that you're not totally yoked to yourself. You're not doing what you want, what you please and live in the delusion of the human reasoning and human understanding lie that everybody else is a victim of. It's so completely corrupt. That's where the liberty is, not freedom to go and do what you want, say what you want, feel what you want, and ooh, the peace. Like when the sister who was told by God, this is the money I want you to give to Michael, she says to me, this is your money. God has told me this is your money and it's a chain around my neck. And if, I, if that bank doesn't call me by Tuesday, I'm going down. What does she do? She listens to the lies of Satan and lets her push back. And, and God has me to not uh, argue with her. God has me not do anything, but just distance myself from her, separate, go your way. And then we see the true fruit. That same person, after I turn away from her, just with silence, that's all I did. Just with silence, just back away, walk away, kick the dust of the feet off. They're not willing, like an Ananias and Sapphira, they're going down that road of allowing Satan to fill their hearts and they hold back some of the money. She did this, she was guilty of it. God says, just back away. He didn't have me correct her. She was clearly uncorrectable, unless by his spirit and in his time. And what happens? She goes to the comment section on the other video and begins to tell this fabulous tale that I somehow or another abused her, that I'm a, a narcissist. And that now all of a sudden she has all this peace and all this rest and sleep has returned and the joy of the Lord is her strength and all this stuff. Why is that? It's the same exact thing that my sister-in-law is saying. There is a temporary counterfeit freedom that you get when you release yourself from the bondage of Jesus Christ. When you're the rich young ruler and Jesus says, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and come and follow me, then you'll have treasures in heaven. You see that he's walking away into what he would call liberty, freedom. Nope, I can't do that. I have to be free to do and live and spend and have and acquire and maintain my wealth. And he walks away into freedom. Oh, he's sad for a time, as are all people who, who knowingly shrink back from what God has commanded them to do. Because they say they can't do it because they don't have a true faith. They didn't go the distance. They shrunk back and they allowed Satan to rob them because you can't do these things without the grace of Jesus Christ. That's the only way I've been able to keep going, not because I'm delusional, but because I have faith. And where did I get the faith? From me? No, it comes from God who sent me. But you do when you disobey God and when you release yourself from the bondage of being a bond servant and you release yourself from truly following the Lord's voice and you release yourself from living a life of faith that requires you taking risks, that requires you living in uncertainty, that requires you moving in the dark, 
that requires you taking steps forward when you can't see anything, that requires you facing circumstances that completely contradict everything you believe God is telling you. And when you move into that kind of life, that that is gonna bring to the nature that you have and you fear. That's gonna bring pain. That's gonna bring anxiety. That's gonna bring uncertainty. That's gonna bring everything that the human nature is designed to withstand. That's why faith is so pleasing to God because when you move forward in faith, you are completely contradicting the devil in you that is totally against God, that is totally against faith, that is totally absent of the kingdom of heaven. I have been trying to get people to see this for years. They are not truly born again. They're not truly in possession. And that's why so many people can come to a channel like this and get all excited and follow for a time and say, praise God. I haven't heard anybody speak with such boldness, such authority. I haven't seen this kind of faith, this kind of obedience. And then they try to emulate my example without emulating my faith without having the gift, without emulating my patience of waiting and calling upon God. Jesus Christ, baptize me in your spirit. Jesus Christ, enable me to live a life of faith. Jesus Christ, grant me the grace I need to do what I cannot do. And they don't. And they come up against the obstacle and they shrink back. And after they make another attempt and another attempt and another attempt and they give up and they say, I can't do this. And then they find a message about legalism or they find a message about, you know, giving your burdening yourself too much or taking this thing too seriously or being too radical or false prophet message this or greasy grace message this. And, oh, you just have to rest in the finished grace of God. You just have to look, just accept all what Jesus has done for you. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out devils? Did we not perform miracles in your name? And I will say, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Not everyone who says to me, Jesus Christ made it clear. He ends the entire Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You cannot do the will of the Father in heaven without the faith of the Father in heaven. You cannot do it with you joining a Christian system and you acting faith. You cannot, as Dale Carnegie said in Christianity, you cannot fake it until you make it. Dale Carnegie taught the world, fake it until you make it. You can't do that in Christianity. You can only go so far, you can fake it until you fail it. And then when you fail it and you still see that this guy who was your original example, and then when you fail and you quit and you grab a hold of Google nonsense that tells you, oh, you're justified. You don't have to have a life of power. You don't have to deny yourself, lose your life, take up the cross, deny yourself. Oh man, that's, that was just for those disciple people. You're a believer, you're a Christian. And then you start hearing this lie from Satan that only special Christians have to deny themselves. It, in spite of the fact Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, oh, but that's just anyone special. That's not the regular old Joe Christian who just really, you know, look, wants to have their cake and eat it too and be able to know that when you shut your eyes in this life, you wake up happy in heaven and everything's wonderful. What an absolute delusional deception. And as hard as it is to hear that you have to lose your life in this life in order to keep it, that's what the master taught and there's no way around it. Jesus said there's a coming king to have war against you in Luke 14. And will you be able to with your 10,000 overcome him with his 20,000? He says, the only way to make peace with this coming king is to give up everything you have. And if you don't want that, then you let it go. And you say, I'm clearly not called to be a Christian. You'd be better off to quit calling yourself a Christian, to quit going to church, to quit reading the Bible, to quit taking the name of Christ on your lips. You'd be better off doing that than to continue going on as a false Christian with no faith, with a total counterfeit, and then to go on Google and find out how you can justify staying in your counterfeit, believing it's real. And then when you look at the guy who you initially followed his example in, and you see that he still goes on, he still has grace, he still suffers for Christ, he still denies himself, he still keeps going forward, not by his strength, not by anything special in him, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, by simply doing what he's always done in the beginning that you valued so much in the beginning of his testimony. But there again, when you hit the wall, and you couldn't follow him anymore, what do you have now but to turn against him? In order to release yourself fully into that, quote, liberty that you feel, the only way you can do that is to completely destroy any credibility of the messenger that you once followed who continues to go on 
And you know what God does? God intentionally takes a guy like that and speaks to him audibly like Ravi every morning at four o'clock in India or uses something so crazy like numbers that can so easily be accused of being numerology so that you stumble and you have a justification why you're not willing to let God speak to you no matter what method he wants to choose. Job 33, 14, God speaks now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it, but you now have got a justification. Well, this is the occult. This is numerology because you don't have have faith. It's like what Peter was told about John the apostle. When Peter starts to ask, what are you going to do in this guy's life? How long does he get to live? What's his purpose? And Jesus tells him, what business of yours is that? You come and follow me. What business is it of ours if God wants to speak to me through this dead rock or this dead tree stump I'm standing next to or a dead chicken comes out of the ground and starts speaking to me right now or an earthworm opens up his mouth and says, hey, big shot, don't step on me, but stay on the narrow path. You're doing a great job. What business is it of anybody's to judge how God wants to speak to another person? It is our business as Christians to judge a tree by its fruit. And it takes faith to even discern what true fruit is. People who try to turn the, oh, he always says, uh, judge a tree by its fruit verse around are people who do not have faith. They don't even have the ability to discern it. Solid food, the book of Hebrews says, is for the mature who have trained themselves by constant use of the word and principles and precepts and commands of God, how to distinguish between good and evil, truth and error. You cannot just come to Christianity and be a king of discernment. It takes obedience. Obedience requires faith. And and true faith is a gift. No matter how strong I sound, no matter how self-righteous, no matter how arrogant, this is what the prophets always sounded like, a very hard, sharp, condemning message. There will be some who can hear it with humility and recognize what I'm I'm saying is true because the Holy Spirit will bear witness to them. But it's the most important thing that I can say in this message is this. This faith is a gift and it is given as a gift, not because of our merit, any more than was our salvation offered to us as a merit for any obedience. The Bible says this is love of God. While we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. There is no merit in salvation. It's a free gift. There is no merit in receiving the free gift of faith. Matthew 7, 11, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to the children who ask, how much more will the heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask? The Holy Spirit is a good gift. And part of receiving the Holy Spirit is the gift of faith, a real faith, a supernatural faith, where Jesus Christ said to the Jews, if you were truly Abraham's children, you would do the works that Abraham did. Abraham's works were taking extraordinary actions, huge risk, leaving everything he had ever known, following this previously unknown voice, called God, setting apart from the land that he had grown and had all of his roots in, going to a place he did not know, believing God for promises he could not possibly perceive. He took risks repeatedly. It cost animals their lives. It cost people their lives. It cost family members. It cost pain. It cost suffering, it cost enduring famine, it cost losing his wife twice, it cost a lot of things. He didn't do it perfect, but he is our father of faith. And the Bible says the true children of Abraham, I just came across it in Galatians 3, 6. Again, are those who live by the faith that Abraham had. The idea that there are special Christians today that don't have to live by faith is a lie. Hebrews says the righteous shall live by faith. Live by faith. Not live as in have eternal life from a moment that you believed Jesus historically existed. That kind of faith cannot save you any more than the same kind of faith that you use to get on an airplane. 
Expecting it to land safely can save you in God's eyes. God is not pleased with that kind of faith. Everybody has it. It is the faith that can call you into a loss. It's the faith that can call you into forsaking the world. When Moses forsook Egypt and forsook his birthright and forsook his fame so that he did not partake of the temporary pleasures of sin in Egypt for a time, but regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as more lofty than all the treasures in Egypt. He did this by faith, having no idea that what he was doing at the time, how it would lead to the significant thing in his life that he did. He forsook all of that. And then God did a mighty work in him, separating him for a time. The first thing he did was he separated himself from all that he had known in the world. And clearly Egypt is a type of the world today. So he separates himself from that. And then God does a mighty work in him. And then God gives him faith to go back to the Pharaoh again and again and again. He does all this by faith, having no idea what the outcome is. We know the outcome. We've read the story. Moses didn't. He didn't know the outcome the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, the seventh time, the eighth time, the ninth time, failure after failure. Israelites are mad at him, wanting to probably hang him up upside down and crucify him. And he keeps going. He keeps believing by faith. And then he has to tell all the Israelites that I know I failed nine times, but look, here's what you have to do. You have to go take this, this lamb, the Passover lamb. God's come to me and said, this is it. You got to believe me. Talk about crying wolf. Moses, you told us nine times. Why are we going to believe you this time? I know guys, just trust me. Go one more time with me on this. We got to go take a land. It has to be perfect and spotless. You have to bring it in your house. Love it. Be tender to it. Four days from now, we're going to kill it. You're going to eat the meat. You're not going to break any bones. You're going to take the blood. You have to eat it all at once. And you're going to take the blood and you're going to put it on your door. How foolish. When you really, really look at these kind of things, you see how foolish it is so easy to go back and read the story and go, well, we know how it worked out. So it's all credible in the end. It's the way my story will be in the end. It's the way Brother Yun's story was in the end. But if you jump in Brother Yun's story, if you would have been one of those along the way, you would have very well have been one of those who were yelling at Dae Ling, his wife, divorce him, divorce him. He's an idiot. God is not with this guy. He's in one jail after another. There is no way he could be a man of God. He's false. He's not hearing from God. These visions that he has, these are all false. God doesn't speak through visions. I read about it on Google. It's a delusion to the mind. He's schizophrenic. Divorce him. But then what happens? The story ends and it comes to a resolution. And then we're all able to, even with carnal faith, even with false faith, we can look at a story and we can make human reasoning and go, well, in the end it worked out. So, well, I guess this was God. Anybody can do that after the fact. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not yet see. It's what I used to tell my poor mother, which I had to say to her, don't you see that you never believe anything until after it happens. You are the number one antagonistic to my faith in all those years. You've seen these things and you never believe until after. You do not have a supernatural faith that can save you. I don't have any reason to believe my mother's born again. She doesn't have a faith that even believes God. How will God be able to justify somebody that stands before him at the throne that says, well, I believed you to get me here on the other side of death, but God says, yeah, but you didn't believe me for anything up to your death. Why should I let you in? How come people can't reason that out? How come people can't see that God cannot be mocked? A man reaps what he sows. You cannot deny him, show him contempt, and cast doubt on his every move and say that he's some impotent old man in a spiritual wheelchair and then finally close your eyes in this life and magically wake up and God is just so pleased with you because 35 years back, you said a stinking prayer from a fat minister who never knew God from day one and somehow another God is supposed to be so pleased with you that he says, welcome in my good and faithful servant who did nothing for him because you didn't have faith, because you couldn't be moved by him. But oh, you watched the documentary. You saw the Bethlehem star. You saw a case for Christ. You saw that an atheist was able to go out and reason Christ into his mind. Well, there must be a reason why. False faith, false faith, false faith everywhere. It's a counterfeit. 
If God can't move you now, he can't save you then. If God can't use you now, he will lose you then. This is all false faith. People haven't realized. And you will sit and you will make fun of my story and you will be those who just shrink back and you fall away from the faith. And then when God brings the story to a final resolution, you will have such spiritual egg on your face that can never be removed except for perhaps maybe a few who will might be able to come to repentance. This is not the spirit of Michael Criswell speaking. This is the spirit of the living Jesus Christ who's been speaking through people like me through for thousands of years with this message, pleading with people, come out of her that you not share in her sins. Come out of the counterfeit and into the real, the Laodicean church. You say to yourselves, we are rich, we are prosperous, we are in need of nothing. And Jesus Christ looks at them like he's looking at many through this message right now and saying, you do not know that you are poor, pitiful, blind, wretched, and naked. And I implore you to buy white robes for yourself and salve for your eyes that you may see that you may not be naked and unashamed. And this is a terrifying message. This is terrifying to know how many people call themselves Christians and have nothing alive on the other side of their profession. Nothing except for a form, religion, practices, words, talk, Bible studies, Bible groups, Bible this, church activities, and it's all for nothing. Where are the few people who will repent in sackcloth and ashes? and ask God to baptize them afresh and save their soul with a saving faith and grant them a faith that will allow God to do what he's always wanted to do, to live and move and dwell amongst men and now through Christ to live inside of them. Imagine how many people are gonna have such a difficult time explaining that Jesus Christ was trapped literally in a spiritual wheelchair inside of them. Now, literally he's not because most people don't have faith, but if people could see this, meaning that they are not even born again, most of these people. So Jesus isn't really inside of them. But if they could only imagine trying to reason this out, I'm gonna stand before Jesus and basically tell him I did nothing for him. I didn't have any displays of real faith in my life. There is nothing that could be pointed to as something that led another person to really trust and believe God. There was no evidence that I lost my life in this world, that I hated this world. There's no real evidence that I was any different from all the other people in the world, except for I didn't go out on Friday nights. I stopped watching pornography and I I didn't watch too many rated R movies. But imagine trying to explain to Christ why he was not able to do anything with your life because you didn't have faith. You basically destroyed your life. You took it, you stole what didn't belong to you so that you could have freedom and call it liberty in Christ by throwing the yoke of Jesus Christ off and just saying, oh, just believe, just believe. Where in the world do you see that when you read the Bible? Where in the world do you get off making a doctrine and throw away all the other pages in the Bible that says all you have to do is say a stinking abominable prayer that doesn't even exist in scripture? and live the lifestyle and be a good person and do good deeds. Yes, that's all part of it, but it's also part of your deception because you haven't read the rest of the also written. So Nehemiah wraps it up with this prayer. He talks to God about these prophets who tried to intimidate me. And then the builders finally complete the wall and Lisa and I are gonna complete ours with God's help. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. And I will end it there and say that all of those who've stood against us, all of those who've misunderstood us, all of those who've cast evil suspicions, all of those who've tried so desperately to save us from our delusion, all of those who so, how unspeakably tragic is it 
for a person to see all that I've shown in all these videos, all these years of evidence of God using this providence of numbers and dates in my life to point me and to, to see all these things fulfilled, building houses without the money by faith, moving to India without the law on my side by faith, building the ministry entirely by faith without any salary, without any advertising, walking into you know at least seven courtrooms without any attorney, without any preparation to defend myself, trusting God, walking down to rescue Tyler into the lion's den, knowing that we're gonna have victory on the other side of it, living all these years, now stopping paying child support when God told me to stop paying it, leaving up videos that a, a judge told me to, to take down or I could face jail or imprisonment, moving into a relationship with Lisa by faith, sending over my tiny house by faith, watching God provide all of this by faith, by faith, by faith. And this is why people hate this story. It condemns their lack of faith. I just want to speak to some of you who have ears to hear with this just last. I just want to plead with you. Please listen to me. If you come up against my story and you find yourself trying to justify by either how I speak, by how God uses numbers, by what happened with P, by what happened with this, and any number of things you try to justify. You are trying to justify yourself, Luke 16, 15. And you are failing to receive the gift that God has for you by faith, to be truly born again. I would ask you, how do you truly know that you're even born again? Are you absolutely certain? And does your life in any way match up to the faith of an Abraham or the faith of a Moses? Jesus said, if you were truly his children, you would do his works. Are you? Galatians says we are. Abraham is our father if we live by faith. And that faith counts us as righteous faith. The example of Abraham is not that Abraham simply believed God existed and sat down in his easy chair. He got up and left. He did something so painful, so costly. My whole life and the life of men like far better than me, Brother Yun, will condemn people who say, all I had to do was say a prayer and I got to be an easy chair Christian. All I had to do was go through the motions and have no power. I didn't have to hear God. He already spoke. It was in his word. I didn't have to obey him. It was just about learning a system and getting myself immersed in a Christian religion. I didn't have to have a living Lord. I had the once been Lord who took care of me 2000 years ago and I'm resting in the finished work of the Lord. Never mind the fact that it says in John 5, 17, my father is always at work and I too must work. Never mind, Jesus said, I have set you an example that you should do to others as I have done to you. Never mind, Jesus said, he who believes in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm resting in the finished work of the finished Jesus 2000 years ago who's been on vacation since then. Please don't let God's dealings in my life, as unusual as they are, be a stumbling block to keep you from entering into true saving faith. You will hear, flee from me, I never knew you. I just, I, I implore you. You can make fun of my life all you want. Go read Brother Yun's life. If you don't like my life and you don't like the way God speaks to me, and you don't like that I hoped like God did in Jeremiah chapter three, that my wife would return and she didn't, and that I was long suffering and persevered, and you don't like how that story came out, and you don't like how God speaks to me through numbers, and you don't like whatever you don't like, and you don't like how I talk to some people who need to be rebuked sharply, do me a favor. Just please do yourself a favor. Go read the book, The Heavenly Man by Brother Yun. He's alive on this earth today. It's not a story from 200 years ago. He's still alive, still living today. And go hold your Christianity up to that. I'm not saying that it has to be to the degree of extraordinary. I'm not saying that you have to have the volume of sufferings. But what I'm saying to you is, you need to be prepared to be just as shocked as he was when he came and visited the West for the first time and saw that what we call Christianity looks nothing like what they call and experience as Christianity. And there was a reason for his shock. There's not a different flavor. This isn't Baskin Robbins Christianity, 217 different countries, 217 different flavors of Christianity. 
Christianity may manifest itself. Circumstances may be different. God's purpose and, and mission may be much heavier evangelism uh, over there, and it may be much heavier prophetic in other areas where they've already heard the truth, meaning not prophetic as in telling the future, but a prophetic as in turn away from that which is false and turn to the truth, which is what is in my heart. If you can't hear it from me, go listen to Brother Yun's story. If you know my story, if you know all the dramatic Go read Brother Yun's story and see that I'm not the only guy experiencing a high drama testimony, a high amount of spiritual conflict, a high amount of antagonism from well-meaning, sincere, professing Christians. Go read and go read and be just as upset with Brother Yun when he stands up in basically a big council meeting. And, and yells out to the people basically about them being stiff-necked and evil that God will punish them. You, you make sure that you take just as much offense to that as you do my messages. And you make sure you get just as weirded out about how God treats him and all the contradictory things and all the quote, false prophecies of go here and, and minister to these people and then he ends up in jail. You make sure that you choke on those things too. And you make sure that you, you, you bring a, a sharp word from John MacArthur up against Brother Yun's testimony where John MacArthur says, God has never once spoken to me outside of the Bible. God doesn't speak anymore. And you make sure you take that teaching and that radio interview with John MacArthur and you, you fit that into the pages of Brother Yun's story. And you tell me that God doesn't speak anymore. You tell yourself at reading that book, tell yourself, uh, this can't be true. God doesn't speak anymore outside the Bible. And, and, and this is a false prophecy. He was told to go to uh, Shangzhou City and uh, he was gonna go there to minister and be a leadership trainer and he ends up in jail. This guy's clearly a false prophet. No wonder all these people are telling his wife to tell him to divorce him. No wonder he struggles so much with money and has so little of it because God's not with him. No wonder he's in jail so much because he's a disobedient Christian. He's mistreated people. He's, he's mean. He's prideful. He's arrogant. No wonder God has allowed him to be drugged through the streets, have electric batons put in his mouth, and made to be a, a, a display of what Christians are not supposed to be in China. Because God is punishing him. God has smitten him. Make sure that you look at this. I'm saying this with, with a, a, a tad bit of irony to, to press my point. So many of you are go, that are hearing my messages are going to hell. And you, you don't even know it. You think you're so pleasing to God and you're on your way to hell. One day, even if not in this life, God will reconcile my story much to your humiliation. Exactly what we just read of what happened with Nehemiah. When his enemies saw that the wall was indeed completed and that it had been the hand of the Lord our God who helped us in the work, they were put to shame. They were frightened. They were humiliated. Don't let that be you. Don't let my tone of voice freak you out and make you feel like I'm not a Christian. Paul had to say how I wish I could change my tone. I am so perplexed about you. I am afraid I have wasted my efforts on you. There is no place for gentleness when you're on your way to hell. The majority of the people who are listening to this, and I would ask you one other thing. I would ask you, for those of you who still struggle with me in whatever way, go get the book by A.W. Pink called The Exposition of Hebrews. Those of you who like expository teaching, go get the book, The Exposition of Hebrews. I challenge every single person listening to me. If you listen to me, please, I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ, either I am right and you are dead wrong or you are right and I am dead wrong. There is no in between. Many of you, we are diametrically opposed. I beg of you, please go get that book, The Exposition of Hebrews by A period B, uh, W period pink, A W pink. And read, jump ahead and read the sections that are all his expositions on Hebrews chapter 11 regarding the faith of Abraham, the faith of Noah, the faith of Isaac, the faith of Jacob, the faith of Joseph, etc. Go read the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses. Go read those 
teachings and watch how he shows that these were written as examples that we are to follow all of us, not for certain special Christians to follow. And go take notice of the fact how he will several times stop and plead with you to take inventory of your faith to see, do you have any of the evidence in your life that shows you have the same kind of a faith of an Abraham or a Moses? It doesn't have to be to the degree. I mean, if that were the case, then even I would be in trouble. I haven't led a bunch of people by the millions out of Egypt. There have been quite a few people that have been led out of the false you know, Christianity, but I wouldn't say that it's anything compared to what Moses did, obviously. So I don't even have the story of a Moses, but what you see in my life, if you are honest, my life looks and plays out exactly like the Bible. My, God's dealing with me in the same bizarre ways, whether it's writing with a hand on a wall, whether it's speaking through a talking donkey, whether it's speaking through a burning bush, whether it's calling you to face in possible circumstances, walk for miles in the dark where you can't see and stick around long enough. And what happens? The story always reconciles. It's always lived by faith and no one who hopes in him will ever be put to shame. Please go read that book and see that I'm in possession of that faith and you need to be too. Go read it. Put away the YouTube videos. You know how easy it is to find a YouTuber to tell you what you want to hear? Don't consult YouTube where you don't even know how the people lived or finished their life. When you read an A.W. Pink, when you read an A.W. Tozer, when you read an Andrew Murray, when you read a Charles Spurgeon, you may not have to agree with every single thing they taught. I told you, neither do I. But at least we know how God testified to their life, especially after they passed away. And we know how they died. We know how they finished and the books are open on their life and people come forward and testify of how they lived behind closed doors. And we know they finished well and we can put confidence in those who have gone before us. When you read something contemporary today on the internet, how do you know how that person's living their life? I'm gonna be an exception to this. And somebody might say, what makes you the exception? Well, I tell you, you find me any other internet site in the world, I would love to see it where for 12 years, a minister of the Lord has turned his entire life and walk of faith, every sin, every weakness, every win, every prayer, every fail, inside out. You show it to me. I'm not suddenly today preaching you something about a person that you have no idea how he's been living for 12 years. My entire story is on the internet. It's been testified to by countless dozens of people who are actually in the story along the way. You know how I live my life. How do you know how the person you're listening to is living their life when they're preaching a message? How do you know? When you have good discernment and you have a lot of fruit and evidence that God's with you, you can listen to people on the internet and you can begin to discern and you can trust God for discernment. I'm asking you to read people's lives who have finished or there have been many multitudes of evidences and fruits and testimonies about their life. Do you know how many thousands of people that I could send you emails from? In fact, you know what I'm gonna do? I just wanna make one point. I just wanna make one point. People testify behind the scenes all the time to this ministry and to how God has used it in their life. Now, if you disagree with them, it's really because, again, your issue is this issue of faith and you have an, a hatred towards the gospel message I'm preaching. You hate the cross, the denial of self, but there are those who do not. And they send testimonies in. And I have received tens of thousands of emails from people, and let's just say thousands and thousands. It's, it's, it'll be tens of thousands, but of remarkable, uh, meaningful uh, emails where God has used my life to, to wake some people up. Have all people continued on? Of course not. In fact, it should be, if I'm a true minister, that the majority of the people fall away from me just like they did Jesus. So here, I, I just want to help you see that 
here's an example of something that happens real time in my life. These examples are countless. This is just literally from yesterday. So I'm just giving you a recent example. Uh, to be fair, uh, day before yesterday, because today's Wednesday. Okay. So I made a message that was similar to the one that you're hearing now. Um, and it, it's a message about faith and the need to have a real faith. And I, I, I did it because uh, I saw a need arise where with a particular person, I saw that where they're stopping is they don't have the gift of faith. And it, it just, it showed me this person is misunderstanding God's dealings in my life because they don't have the supernatural gift of faith. So I made the message and I thought that day I would stop the series temporarily, put the message up. So I am praying, God, would it be okay with you? Because brothers and sisters, I try to not do anything that father will not allow me to do. And I, meaning that this message will not go up until Father gives me an okay on it. So I did this message on faith. I am sitting in the parking lot at this coffee shop, a new coffee shop that I'm going to. And I'm praying and I, I just always pray before I go into the coffee shops almost all the time. And I just, I said, Lord, you know, please guide me and direct me and went through my prayer. And I said, Lord, you know, if you do, if you want me to put this message up today, I'd love to. My plan is to do that. I, I had a plan to, to put that message on faith up that day. And it was, so I was going to delay that message and I was going to put up this message on faith. And I, I turned to get out of the car. And as I'm just twisting out of my seat, my head naturally looks back to look in the direction where I'm going. My eyes go right to it. The car parked directly behind me. The only car I can see, 919. Many of you listening to my story, you know that 919 is the number, numbers 919 that God led me to many, many years ago to let me know to stay put. And while the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed God and did not set out. And God uses some other scriptures to point me to say, make sure I don't add or take away from what he's doing, including Deuteronomy 12, 32. And that's how I sometimes know, don't put that message up. So here is an example. This is a completely unsolicited email. Uh, let every matter be established by two or three witnesses. So here's a person in another country, New Zealand, incidentally, how ironic. I've never met this person. And yet this person sends me uh, this email. I'll read part of it. Dear Michael and Lisa, it was so amazing listening to your last two videos. I had been listening to Preparations for Suffering by John Flavel when your video came in. And then I was listening to his other book, Keeping the Heart, when your latest one came in, and they were just so confirming everything you said. Last night, the testimony of Helen Rosevier came up again on YouTube. Um, Helen Rosevier, it's spelled R-O-S-E-V-E-A-R-E, -E -E, who went and ministered down in Africa, and she ended up being raped twice. And God did some remarkable things. I only saw a part of her testimony, but man, I tell you what, when you listen to that message, you can see here is a remarkable woman of God and woman of faith. So go please listen to her testimony. One of her videos came up again on YouTube, which I had listened to when it first came out over a year ago. So I decided to listen again. She has an incredible testimony. Then your latest video came up this morning and she validated everything you said as well. It was incredible, especially the part where she was lined up with other missionaries to be shot and also what the Lord told her regarding her sufferings. I still look forward to listening to every one of your messages that comes up. They have, they have a spiritual depth to them that few others, if any, have, especially amongst modern day preachers. Why is this, brothers and sisters? Here's a lady. Don't take my word for it. Here's a lady in New Zealand who's been following the ministry for years, testifying that God is providentially guiding her to other videos that are matching in content things I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness where two or three witnesses are to witness to this. I just want you to see this kind of thing happens all the time. But then you come and you testify against me and you say, I'm a numerologist. I'm an occultist. You say, I'm a liar. You say, I'm a narcissist. You say, I'm arrogant. You say, I'm prideful. You say, I'm deceived. You say, I'm a lover of money, a lover of self. You say, I'm whatever, whatever. Put us in court together. 
Put us in court together, you and me and my accuser. Let us face each other in court and you bring your best evidence that God is with you. And I'll bring the best evidence that God is with me. And let's see what would happen in a court of law. And I would just ask you to ever so humbly consider that now. When you don't like something I'm teaching you, when you don't like I'm asking you to stop doing something, when you don't like I'm asking you to start doing something, which by the way, are only the teachings that are coming out of the Bible. These are not my teachings. And you disagree with me and then you turn against me. Be wise, humble yourself and ask yourself, look, you're never gonna meet me in this life. The chances of you meeting, so it's not like you have to worry about saving face here. And it's not like I'm talking to you by name. There's no need for personal humiliation or loss of public dignity over this. I'm asking you when you get done listening to this message, go look yourself in the mirror. <clears throat> look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, Am I truly a child of God? Is Jesus Christ truly living, moving, breathing? And am I having my being in him? Am I living a life of faith? Am I in possession? No matter what size it is, no matter what stage of the game I'm in, am I in possession of a faith that allows me to do the impossible? Jesus Christ said, everyone who believes in him will do what he has been doing and will do even greater things than these. Jesus Christ taught that if we are truly children of Abraham, we will do the works of Abraham. Look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, am I a true child of God? Am I calling Jesus Lord, Lord and not doing what he's saying? Is the living Christ actually living inside of me? Do I know that if I passed away right now, that I am absolutely certain that God is pleased with me, that I have a saving faith in my heart, or am I just hoping with a bunch of other people by the millions who are sharing my hope, but unknowingly are heading off a cliff? Look yourself in the eye. I dare you. And you know, most of you won't even be able to do this. Look yourself in the eye and ask yourself and ask God, am I in true possession of a life-saving faith? Am I somebody who truly has given up everything for you? Am I truly somebody who has part of the ecclesia? Have I been truly called out of the world as you define it? Not just uh, thinking I am because I put myself inside of a, a gathering of a bunch of people who talk about you and who are all talk but have no power. Matter of words and talk, not is the kingdom of God, but of power. Ask yourself, do I have evidence that I have lost my life in order to find it? Is there evidence that I hate my life in this world? Is there evidence that I'm in possession of not just the word of God, but grace? When nobody is around, ask yourself this question. When nobody is around, can you look inside that mirror in your eyes and say that you see the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and be very careful about allowing Satan to ask you about that, about me right now, because you have to understand I'm speaking to you in the prophetic and you cannot find any prophecy, any prophetic warnings, any words from God coming from a prophet that sounds like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is a message that is meant to stir fear in you, to warn you from a false delusional faith that cannot save you. Ask yourself that question. Do you have that in you? I see it in me, whether or not somebody who's mad at me sees it or not. I mean, clearly look, Paul, he tells the Galatian church that when he first came to them due to an illness and preached the gospel to them, that they received him as if he were an angel, as if he were perhaps Jesus Christ himself that they would have pulled out their eyeball for him. And he then has to say, but now have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? And you would ask this, would they then have said, oh yes, Paul is filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Would they have testified to the fruit after they got mad at him, after he confronted their sin? Would the Corinthians who he had to so sharply rebuke and say, I can't even address you as spiritual, but as carnal, as worldly. And then I'm afraid I've wasted my efforts on you. 
and that you should be such ashamed of yourself because I hear there's a sexual immorality amongst you that, that doesn't even happen amongst the pagans. A man has his stepmother. And so we look at this kind of a situation and so just, I'm asking you to be fair. Don't let Satan right now say, well, Michael's not this and Michael's not that. No, I, when Michael looks in the mirror and when I'm not in the role of giving a hard prophetic message to somebody, telling them something they don't wanna hear, I know what is in me. My wife knows what's in me. My son knows what's in me. And I know what's in me. A tree is recognized by its fruit. Examine yourself, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to see if you're truly in the faith. Go look yourself in the mirror. Don't go to YouTube and say, how can I know if I'm saved? That's like going up to the devil and asking him how he can know, how you can know if you're saved. Who do you think runs internet? Satan, uh, can you tell me what's the evidences I should look for? What are the marks of true salvation in Christ? Well, I'll tell you, all I have to do is say a prayer, go forward, mean sincere, say a bunch of prayers, read your hymnal book, sit in the church, make sure you walk and act and quack like all the rest of the ducks sitting in there and trust in the finished work of Christ and you'll be as good as gold. Go look yourself in the eyes. I can look myself in the eyes. I don't lose sleep at night except for when somebody's making a bunch of noise or I wake up with indigestion in my stomach or something like that. My sleep is undisturbed by my conscience. I don't have any concerns about where I'm going. And you know something other people may say, oh, but my sleep is good too. I've seen people that I know that are not possession of a true faith. And they say suddenly, oh, my sleep is better when I separated from Michael. You know why? Because you're now separate from the obedience that God was calling you to. You're separate from the faith. You're separate from the correction. And Satan is no longer antagonizing you, trying to prevent you from being used in a way that is fruitful and righteous. And when he sees he's defeated you, he will leave you in peace. If only some professing Christians would recognize that Jesus said, my peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. I do not give as the world gives, but Satan gives as the world gives. And if you want to be defeated, if you want to not fight against sin, if you want to uh, not be in bondage to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to shrink back in fear, Satan will leave you alone. Once he's tormented you, He'll leave you alone and you'll have peace naturally. If your enemy goes away, you'll have peace, but that's a false kind of peace. You don't want to have peace at the expense of the truth, at the expense of righteousness. That's a false peace that ends in a terrible eternal death. Is the peace that you have, do you have a sense of peace that you're at peace with God, as A.W. Pink was talking about. Have you stopped fighting against God when he asks you to do something? Have you stopped fighting against your him and, and your love for the world? Have you stopped fighting against carrying your cross, denying yourself? Have you stopped fighting against him being Lord in your life? Do you have peace with God? I have peace with God. The only time I don't have peace with God is when I somehow or another in the flesh for a time or two, in some way, begin to fight back against something he's asking me to do. That's the only time I don't have peace. And then as soon as I relinquish that, I have it. Oh God, I tell you, how many of you have peace? How many of you are illegitimate children not even being disciplined by God? Are you being disciplined by God? Can you point to real ongoing disciplining in your life? Are you being disciplined? This is the mark of a true child of God, Hebrews chapter 12. I see so many people who I correct and I hope, oh God, discipline them and he doesn't. And it's, that's, that's very, very sad for me to see. There's a scripture that talks about the man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly come to disaster. There are some people who just simply do not repent. Look yourself in the eyes. Are you a true child of God? Is God the living Christ living inside of you? And what is the evidence that you have besides some YouTube notion and millions of other people who agree that what you have is a saving faith, is a saving faith. When the Bible says it is the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road and the narrow gate that leads to life and only a few find it, look yourself in the eyes. Are you one of the few that have found it? Ask yourself this question now. 
some somebody would say, I'm not trying to say this to scare you. That's not true. I am trying to say this to scare you. I am trying to get you to be afraid of the reality of where you're headed. If you do not have a true saving faith in Christ, is it worth it for you to keep your life and all of your good pleasures and all of your delusional desires down here and forsake eternal life forever? I was recently with a friend on a trail and at one point I stooped down and I grabbed one grain of sand from the trail and I put it in my hand. And I said, this represents a hundred years. And then I reached over and said, now imagine if I take all these grains right here in my sand. I said, we can't even count how many, perhaps there's 50 million grains of sand in my hand here on this right. I said, try to imagine that this grain over here is 100 years and all these grains over here are 50 million times 100 years. And then I said, now look beneath our feet and all over this mountain, all the sand. And I said, eternity is more than all the grains on all the trails and all the beaches, on all the mountains, on all the woods, on all the deserts in all the world. Try to get your head around that brothers and sisters. We get so upset about God telling us we need to give this up, give that up. People get so mad at me because I preach this hard, narrow path, cross-carrying life, but how mad are they gonna be if I don't wash my hands of their blood now when they stand before Jesus Christ and find out they held on like the devil to that little grain, that little pitiful grain they had in their hand, not even a hundred years worth will they get out of that grain and gave up all the sand beneath their feet they've ever walked in their whole life and that every person on this earth has ever walked and then some. They gave up all of that just so they could be right and justified in the eyes of whatever YouTube video you just went and watched or whatever delusional lie you just told yourself. You miss out on eternal life because you're not willing to lose that one grain of sand. You cannot convince me that's not the greatest blunder in the history of all creation than to give up an entire eternity which is so unfathomable even to the human mind in order to keep that one little pitiful, worthless, totally undignified, wretched piece of sand that you have that represents 100 years which you won't even see. It's, it has to be the greatest blunder. The, it's the definition of stupid. Beyond what anything's ever been stupid, this is the stupidest thing you could ever do. And Satan loves it and wants to convince you of it. I just beg of you to see that most of you have been injured in your heart. That Those of you that hate me, you've been injured in your heart. Somebody hurt you when you were young. Most of you have got stories that are so, you're so filled with pain and you've got issues of unforgiveness. I can tell you right now, I can think of three people who recently rejected me when I confronted them about something and they turned away from me in their heart and I had to turn away from them because I saw that God was saying, turn away from them, three people. And you know, what's amazing to me that all three of them have serious injuries that happened in their childhood or in their life in general and how they were treated. But most of them, they have injuries from things that people that were in their life were supposed to do to them, hurt them, and they've never fully healed from it. And they have rotten fruits that come out of it. In fact, actually a fourth person comes to mind right now. And every single one of these people, they all have this in common. They have terrible, terrible family injuries and brokenness in their heart and pains and anguish about how other people treated them. That every single person that I've tried to correct in some loving way who was going along with me and testifying that God was blessing every person I can think of. So many, another one just comes to my mind. So many people, and they have these injuries, these offenses, there's offense in their heart. And unforgiveness, a root of bitterness has grown up to defile many. And then suddenly when I come and touch on something, this is meant to be a very serious, solemn, Warning, this is meant to be a message of rebuke and condemnation to unbelief. And it is a crying shame on us that so many of us call ourselves by the name of the living Lord, the God of the all creation, Jesus Christ, who taught us all the things he did about living a life of love, faith, and power. 
and we live these empty, powerless shells and we take his name on our lips, it will be to our greater condemnation that we have done so. Satan is the author of it, but we are responsible for our actions. And once we know the truth, we have an obligation to take a choice. And, and you're obligated to take a choice when you hear this. You can continue on the path and think that I'm delusional and think that I'm this and think that I'm that. And you can justify to the hills why I'm the, uh, I'm the deceived Christian and you're the right Christian. And one day when God is ready, even in this life or in the life to come, he'll validate and vindicate this story. And just like Nehemiah, you will find yourself ashamed, afraid, and humiliated. Rather than right now, if you have the the grace and you have the humility to do so, humble yourself now, lest you be humiliated later. Humble yourself to the truth now and God will exalt you. God will help you. I, I, this is the final point I promise I'm making. Remember that this faith that I'm in possession of is a gift. I'm not better than any person I'm preaching to. I'm guilty and capable of every sin you are. I have flesh. I know that in me dwells no good thing, but I have received by faith the promise that I can escape the corruption of this world and my nature, that I can put to death the life, that I can live not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, that I can put down the misdeeds of the body and I can live a life of love and joy and peace in the spirit, that I can have a Romans 8 life where I live by the spirit, Galatians 5.25, and that I can win the victory, Galatians 5.17, between my two natures by faith, and that I can hear God by faith, that I can obey God by faith, that I can trust God by faith. This is not something I have that makes me special. This is a gift that's been given to me despite that I am the, the worm of worms, that I am the fool of fools, that I am the weak of the weak. This is not at all, do not allow Satan to say, yeah, Michael just thinks he's better than you. No, I do not. I think I'm better off than you if I'm not speaking to you, a person who has the same kind of faith I do. I'm better off than you. We're all better off. All true Christians on the narrow path, denying themselves, taking up the cross, losing their life to find it. All true Christians are better off. None of them are better than. Election is election. You don't get chosen because you have merit. And I don't have this gift of faith because I earned it. I'm not doing the things I'm doing because God has seen that I'm so meritous of all this. No, it is a gift. I'm learning this more than ever. This is a gift God's given me. My responsibility is to steward it and to stay humble about it and not to think I'm some big shot about it. God is the big shot. He's doing some big things in many people's lives who have faith, but the, the person who he's doing it through is the vessel. After we have Luke 17, 10, done all that we've been asked to do, we should say that we've only done what we've asked to do and we should consider ourselves un worthy servants. I'm an unworthy servant. Whether, whether I was ever called a prophet, whether I was ever given a prophetic call, whether I was the least or the greatest of them, I am nothing apart from Jesus Christ, as are you. We are nothing apart from him. Everything is by faith. So please, I beg of you, I know this was a long message, evaluate yourself again. I know that so many of you will not be able to hear it. You're deceived and you're gonna just be convinced. Ah, Michael, he's just arrogant. You're gonna come up with all kinds of excuses to pave your own way to hell. But I have to tell you, by the praise of God, my blood will not be on your hands. I have not failed to preach to you the whole counsel and the whole requirements of what it means to be a cross carrying, self-denying, world-hating, faith-walking Christian. May God grant you grace and mercy and faith to live and walk as Jesus did.